Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Chris Reid. I'm the CEO of and founder of Neo Metals. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to present today at uh, Tracy's wonderful conference. This is the second one I've attended. I can thoroughly recommend it. So Neo Metals, well, what are we? I mean, our, our strategy is to create our own opportunities. Uh, we've been in the mining industry, uh, my family, for four generations. We've got access to some very good deposits and some very good people. Uh, we have a very healthy balance sheet. Um, and really, we take a, an approach of de-risking. Um, risk is much more of a focus uh, or certainly a major consideration when having a look at the returns. How we, how we like to structure our businesses are to bring uh, a little bit like tennis, uh, playing doubles, you want to have a, a strong partner where you're weak. Uh, and certainly when you come to have a look at uh, lithium minerals, um, a lot of people want to go down uh, stream processing. Uh, I have heard the odd guy wanting to go down to actually making electric bikes. Uh, but you can only be good at so many things. So what we generally do is bring in a strong operating or financial partner. When you come to something like lithium where you can't exchange trade it, the offtake is, is uh, one of the major, or the marketing risk is one of the major sources of financial risk. Um, and, uh, and how we do that is normally we bring, we attract them um, with either an operating cost advantage or a capital cost advantage from the deposit's grade or its location. So uh, it's worked for us so far, uh, we've got about, 55 million bucks in the bank. We paid a dividend last month and you know, we're one of the few guys that will do a presentation and say, well, actually don't buy any shares because you'll be competing against us. Um, so corporate details, look, we all appreciate the lithium tailwind. Um, don't get me wrong, we're very happy with it. Uh, our family are strong shareholders in the project. So all of our projects are in separate purpose vehicles. Um, the Mount Marion mine, which we're building the world's largest hard rock lithium concentrator. Uh, we have uh, Australia's largest contract processor of minerals, a company called Mineral Resources. They're a billion dollar company uh, operating the mine. Ganfeng, who are China's largest lithium producer, uh, taking the offtake 100% uh, for the first three years. And uh, we've got some downstreaming technology. Uh, and then we have some assets uh, in titanium and titanium related technology and nickel assets. Uh, we are spinning out and we'll give that back to the shareholders. So at Neo Metals, lithium and titanium, we think you know, they're, they're pretty comfortable. We're pretty comfortable with those being the right elements that we want to be in. So we have a look at the demand. Um, you know, look, everyone's got an opinion. Chris, if you were worried, um, Daniela down at uh, Signum Box, she was SQM's commercial manager for a number of years. She, she has the best intelligence on Brian uh, bar none. Um, Roskill are probably a little bit better in the hard rock. So the market's growing at about 15%, which is, uh, which is really good. It's going, you know, there's not too many commodities in the world that have got the growth um, thematics behind lithium. And really where we see you know, us being just at the start of this journey, um, you know, we're looking, uh, and I think Judy said yesterday, at about 46 gigawatt hours of storage. Now, this was a, a, came out of a university, the University of Western Australia last year. As the price of the batteries come down, the adoption rate, so it's growing pretty well there at about 40 odd percent. Uh, and then once you get to the point where it's 250 bucks a kilowatt hour, you start to double it every year. And you know, 1500, so you're talking a multiple, um, you know, of 30 times what we're currently using by 2025. Uh, and the Tesla guys brought down that, and you know, uh, certainly in the US, you have a look, you know, economic theory is good. You, you really have to look at the commercial reality. So Berkshire Hathaway got a company called NV Energy, signed a 25 year power purchase agreement with First Solar for a dedicated solar farm lithium battery array, uh, and it was 3.87 cents US per kilowatt hour, which is just about what the guys in Quebec pay for hydro. So certainly we're past grid parity in the US, Australia, it's past, it's about 15 cents a kilowatt hour if you amortise it, you know, much less than diesel. So, you know, it's just, it's the way life's going to go. And why the prices are where they are at the moment is, is down to a couple, of, a couple of points. Yes, the brines hold about 70% of the world's resources. You do have to modify that, that there's not a great conversion rate into reserves. It typically takes five to seven years uh, to bring brine production on. So 
Uh, the guys at FMC took them about seven years to get that under steady state production. The guys at SQM just about ran out of money. They couldn't afford to get sodium carbonate. The guys from FMC sent it down from Wyoming and got repaid back in lithium carbonate. So um, the journeys are generally pretty hard. Uh, the guys at Oricobra have, have found that out too. Um, the Chinese can build a converting plant in under 12 months. Um, we've had our project for seven years, so we're not sort of fly-by-nighters. Um, but we're ready and we're coming into production now. Um, and so that's, that's taken us, you know, about a year. We made the final investment decision last year and we'll be in production uh, in the next quarter. And the market's really bifurcated. So you've got the Western world, uh, it's pretty evenly divided down the date line for some reason. So all the brines uh, go into uh, Asia x China, uh, Europe and the US. The Chinese also um, export as well. Um, but in essence, they produce half the world's lithium and they consume half the world's lithium. Um, they're starting to put in a few trade practices um, that are mildly aggressive. You know, they're not refunding the, uh, the VAT uh, and associated costs, so there's about a 25% penalty if they try to export it. And China, you know, that's been the demand in China. They've got 500 lithium ion battery plants. No one in this room, no one in the West actually knows what their capacities are. Um, suffice to say, it must be pretty good demand because they're paying twice what we pay in the West for our lithium. Um, and of course, in that environment, we can charge more for our rock. Now, traditionally, the Chileans set the price. Uh, the Chinese had to compete with the Chileans and the Chinese told the Australians how much we could have for our rock. Uh, in the current market, um, you know, you need about eight tonnes of spodumene for one tonne of lithium carbonate, so it's costing them about 4,300 US a tonne for the rock. It's costing them about, depends who they are, but, you know, maybe somewhere around two and a half to 3,000. So the cost in China for carbonate's about US 7,500, and they're getting 15,000 US on volume. So, yes, there is room for us to potentially charge more for our rock next year if the price goes up, but we do have to be careful um, that, you know, uh, we've seen what happens in iron ore. In a good market, you can get more for your iron ore, but as soon as the, the gloves on the other hand, the Chinese can put the foot down. So we moved to Mount Marion. Um, we've sold down interests, uh, our equity in the project to make it a reality, uh, to bring those partners in. So Mineral Resources are putting uh, the world's largest lithium concentrator, uh, operating it on a mine port to solution, no upfront capital cost to us. We've got certainty, we've got minimum production levels, we've got contractually set construction times, we've got fixed rate mining and processing costs. So on the, on the cost side of the ledger, no one's ever had that certainty uh, and the lowest variability. Um, Gan Feng, and that's the other half, so you can always be assured of incurring operating costs. I mean, that's not hard. Um, the other side that you generally have to worry about is, is getting the revenue, uh, and especially, you know, if you're selling into China. So what we've done is um, we've got a life of mine take or pay with Ganfeng. They've put about 65 million bucks into my company already, uh, buying equity in the mine. At market price, uh, we have a floor price based on actual delivered cost into China plus a margin. So it's a very good market uh, if you're ready. Um, We've got a $20 million revolving letter of credit and we can take 100% of the value as soon as the ship leaves Australia, which is good for us. And most importantly, after three years of full production, we can take back our equity share. So we can look at the downstreaming and the massive uplift. So, um, you know, lithium is still an oligopoly. So you've got three big brine producers. Uh, you've got Albemarle, FMC and SQM, and you've got two big Hard rock converters, you've got Tianji that own half, a Gal uh, half of Talison, or half of the Greenbushes mine, and you've got Ganfeng that own 43.1% of us. The Chinese guys, multi-billion dollar companies, operate on PEs of well over 100. Uh, and that's because, not because they have the mines, it's because they convert the white rocks into white powder. That's what we want to do in time, but we want to do it on a staged basis and not take the risk. So we're located about 40 k's from Kalgoorlie, which is Australia's gold mining capital, my hometown. Um, first started working uh, at a mine very close there when I was 17, so it's pretty hard to get lost. Uh, we've got high voltage power, fresh water to site, um, granted mining leases, 
We inherited about four or five million tonnes of resources. We've drilled that out to 23, which we figured was enough for 10 years. I mean, modelling anything over 10 years on a DCF basis is almost pointless. Uh, the ore is white and the waste rocks are black. So it's a very simple mining operation. Uh, we're just finishing 40-odd thousand metres of RC drilling uh, to extend the resources and join them up. So we'll have a new resource reserve. Uh, and we've pegged additional ground. We've leased some ground to the north. We brought the mine to the west, uh, an old gold mine that I used to work at. And uh, so we've put the plant uh, next to an open pit and we're just going to dump the tailings back in the old pit, saves us about 10 million bucks. So we've got a three-stage uh, jaw, cone and tertiary roll crusher. We then put that into um, dense me two-stage dense media separation for a 4% product, about 200,000 tonnes of 6%, uh, and about 80,000 tonnes of 4% fines. And, and in this market, we can sell that. You, normally, you couldn't. Um, so there's the plant. The front end of the plant's got about 5 million tonne throughput capacity. The back end of the plant's well over 2 million tonnes. So it's about 50% bigger in throughput than green bushes. Um, we don't have the benefit of their grade. Uh, can you play that video, please, sir? This is what they mean when they say lithium boom. What's it say? Cannot play media. Okay. Well, you can have a look on our website, and that's the first blast at Mount Marion. Um, so the crushing plant is finished. We've dry commissioned it and start wet commissioning it uh, this week. Uh, and there's the beneficiation plant. Um, like I said, it's, uh, it's the world's biggest, and we can expand it more. So our near-term milestones, uh, you know, we're going through and hitting those. Got a number of re-rating events coming up over the next uh, the next two quarters, which is great. Um, and you know, as I was saying, you know, the the Chinese guys are operating on PEs of you know over 100, which is very abnormal. Somewhere where we'd be happy if we could get you know just part of the way there. So we've got a process that basically takes the rock, uh, makes a lithium chloride solution, and then runs electricity through it. So what we've done is basically we're putting a new feed into chloralkali. And now chloralkali is a 100-year-old technology. We've got a semi-pilot plant down in Buffalo where I'm going on Friday. So basically um, we leach uh, our lithium oxide ore with hydrochloric acid, uh, purify it, run electricity through it. We recover uh, lithium hydroxide. Uh, and then we recover the hydrogen and chlorine, burn that, make HCl, and so you need a little bit of top up. But this is probably, you know, as uh, as Guy was saying, you know, th these are essentially like closed loop, the greenest way that you can you can possibly make uh, a lithium hydroxide product. In terms of uh, where it puts us, our definitive feasibility study, which is getting done by the German engineering company M and W, will be out next month. Uh, our old pre-feasibility put us, uh, you know, pretty pretty much, and we're using we're using market price for spodumene, so we're not using the cost at the mine. We're using the market price of the input, which I think you you normally uh, should do. Most importantly, it puts us in front of the Chinese converters. Now these aren't um, according to size, um, but 75% of the world's lithium hydroxide comes out of China. In terms of a capital cost advantage. Uh, we produce about uh, about half the cost, in, uh, sorry, per production ton from the Chinese, and about a third of the brine producers, and that's essentially because we can ring up any one of ten um, chloralkali uh, manufacturers and, and get a sell. And in fact, there's um, uh, there's plenty of chloralkali plants on standby around the world. Um, and as someone asked me yesterday, you know, you've got plenty of cash, apart from giving some back to the shareholders, are you looking at buying anything? And my comment was, well, in the pre-feasibility study, I think the IRR was about 94%. Now, in our updated uh, DFS, that will be over 100%. Um, so if you can find uh, me a project that, you know, can be a reality because we've got our own source of ore and we can build it in time to contractually take it. Uh, please give me your card and introduce yourself. So as I said, we're completing the definitive feasibility study. We'll run a full stage pilot 
uh, the hydromet and the electrolysis sections and move to a final investment decision in 2017. It's probably a two, two and a half year build, uh, which means that contractually we'll be able to feed it with our own ore. So I guess as an investment proposition, uh, how we sort of distinguish ourselves um, is that the lithium boom is now, the demand is now, we're in one of the only two new hard rock mines coming into production. Uh, so exposed to the upside on it. Uh, it's not going to last forever. Um, we made the first decision to build this plant in 2010 and I've still got bits of the old float circuit rusting on site. So we've been through a full cycle. Uh, I'm pleased to say that all the brine producers are at full capacity. They don't have any spare capacity like in the rare earth to, to muck around with the price. Uh, the demand uh, is coming both from the EVs and the renewable energy storage. Like I said, the, uh, the EVs, it's not really driven from a, a strong economics point of view. They're just, it's flavour of the month. They're good cars, don't get me wrong, but they're for rich people. Whereas the renewable energy storage uh, and electricity, uh, for me, just for my house with a, a Tesla power wall and some panels, and we probably pay twice what you guys do, um, you know, the payback is, is very good. It halves my electricity cost, uh, which is good. So thank you very much for uh, your attention.